of the goodness of God. Oh, I want to sing of the goodness of God. Lord, I pray that we just celebrate you this week. God, that we just bask in your goodness. Lord, and I just pray for the message this morning, God, that you touch our hearts and you just put it on our heart to continue out this 224 project this month. Just put that service on our hearts, Lord God. And we love you in your name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Oh, it's another Sunday. And it didn't snow. Yes, I, I said somebody coming in, it's like, oh, it's good to see you. It didn't snow today. Yeah, so, but uh, be careful on the way to the car in the parking lot. You might need ice skates. It's, uh, who knows? It's supposed to get warm today. Let's just jump right into it this morning. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ... Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Lord, we pray that as we think about our relationship with you this morning, that you would help us to draw close, that you'd keep us tender, that you'd have your way in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We need this all the time, don't we? Since we have been raised with Christ. So this is talking to those who have responded to Jesus, those who have said, yes, Lord, I need a Savior. Understand that that in the context of everything I'm going to say today, it is said to those who are Christ followers. People have said, I can't do this on my own. I can't get into heaven on my own. I can't live in a pleasing way for God on my own. I need Jesus. That's what it's all about. Responding to Jesus and saying, yes, forgive my sins. Come, fill me with your spirit. Help me to live for you. And since we have been raised with Christ, for we were dead in trespasses and sins, but now we've been made alive in Christ, we're told here that we should set two things, our hearts on things above, our affections, right? And our minds on things above, not on earthly things. Because we get involved in all of this and we get dragged down. So how do we do that? How do we set our hearts and our minds on Christ who is our life? Well, there's lots of ways we do that. Our our daily time and the Word. uh, But more than anything else, it's through prayer. It's our connection to the Father through Christ. It's as we share our desires, as we share our hearts with Him, And as we listen, as he speaks to us through his word and by his spirit. Prayer is our lifeline to Jesus, who is our life. Years ago, I heard a message. I don't remember if I read it, heard it, whatever. Anyway, the the man's name was Ed Rowell. And he, he had this message for pastors, okay? It was called Three Sins of the Prayerless Pastor. And you think, prayerless pastor? Oh, yeah. You know, pastors, just like anybody else, we get involved in life and and things are coming at us from here and there and and their kids and wives and husbands and, you know, different aspects of life and, and we get busy, 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 and then at the end of the day you go, well, I didn't really spend any time in prayer today. And that message was, 
it was so convicting to me at that time about the need to be in prayer. He talked about three sins of prayerless preachers, and it convicted me then. It convicts me now because I have been and am still at times guilty of all three of these sins. Now everybody's listening, saying, oh, 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 what's he going to share? In thinking about this, though, I realized that this doesn't apply just to pastors or preachers that it applies to all of us. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you. You know, in, in the Bible, as you think about and pray for the new pastor that's coming, uh, you know, there's a list of, of people who are going to be overseers or pastors and teachers or elders, and there's a list of, of qualities that they have, and you can see them in, in Timothy and Titus, and Paul gives this list about people that are going to lead the church. And sometimes people read that and say, oh, they need to be here. All the rest of us are here. And that's not really what that's all about. What that's all about is saying, if you're going to have somebody that lead, try to pick somebody that's going to be a good example of what we all should be. So when you read those lists and pray for somebody who's going to lead, also realize that that applies to you. So these three sins of prayerless pastors are also three sins of prayerless people. (laughs) You're all preachers, I guess that fits too. Somebody says, your wife a preacher? No, only at home. But, you know, it's the old thing is when, when the pastor or the preacher is, is doing this kind of thing, right? Pointing a finger. There are three. They're heading back this way. And when I'm sharing a message, most of the time, I'd like to think all the time, but most of the time, it's really... You're just listening to what God's talking to me about my own heart. And I just share it with you. See, when we're prayerless, that doesn't mean we don't pray at all, but but when we live our lives without relying on prayer, that means we're not relying upon God. Who does that mean we're relying upon? Myself. Or as a church, our programs. Or ideas. Our ingenuity, our effort, all those things might be important, but without prayer, they don't mean anything. Because without Jesus, we can do nothing. So when we're prayerless, it means we're depending on ourselves and not the Lord. And this results, and this is what Ed Rowell was talking about, in three things. Cynicism, callousness, and compromise. Pretty easy to remember those, the three C's, you know. Cynicism, callousness, and compromise. So let's look at cynicism. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and then we'll drop to verse 15. The word of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, King James says vanity, vanity, Meaningless, meaninglessness of the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labor which as they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun set and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning to its course. Ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place of streams, to the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome. More than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing. The ear, it's fill of hearing. What has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is, and you know this phrase, right? There is nothing new under the sun. Verse 15, what is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. Boy, 
aren't you glad you came this morning? You know, you read that, you go, well, that's kind of the way I feel. Can anybody say COVID? <laughs> Meaningless. On and on. When will this all end? We keep thinking it'll end, and then next week they'll come out with the, uh, you know, Tau variant. <laughs> Whatever. And he goes on and says, all things are wearisome. So when we're not connected to the Lord, we lose that sense of hope. Cynicism. What is cynicism? Eh, what's the use? Why do we even try? I mean, I pick up my underwear and then she wants me to do something else. Or mom and dad, I do this and then they want that. It never ends, right? That's the, you know, the, the Charlie Brown version of adults. And you feel like, I don't know why I even bother. You know, this is the reason so many marriages end. It's not because of the pain in the marriage. Oh, it's that. But it's the pain in the marriage with the idea that I don't think it's ever going to get any better. There's no hope. I mean, this kind of thinking leads ultimately to suicide. Some people's suicide is slow through drugs and alcohol or other things. Just slowly. That cynicism. What does it matter? You hear about the, uh, the pastor that uh, he left the ministry, he left being a pastor to become a funeral director. Somebody says, well, why'd you do that? He says, well, he says, a pastor, I got tired of straightening people out, and then they just went back to where they were at. He says, as a funeral director, when I stay straighten people out, they stay straight. When we cease to pray, we lose touch with God, we lose that sense of hope, it's futility, it's, it's the what's the use thinking, it's nothing changes, why bother, it's, it's watching the news and getting depressed. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah has come off the mountain, he's been on the mountain, God sent the fire. He prayed, and the rain is coming, and now after all this high, there's this low, and he's going to see God. And he's in this, this place of cynicism. Verse 11 of 1 Kings 19 says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. We read this not too many weeks ago, but it's good. We'll read it again. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the winds, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, a still small voice. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And the Lord speaks to him in this soft voice and says, What are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you here? Why are you not doing what I called you to do? Right? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I... I am the only one left. And you hear it, right? I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Yeah, on the way, he sat down under that tree and prayed, let me die. Sometimes we get that feeling like, it doesn't matter what I do, and I can't make a difference, and what's the use, and all of that. And that's the way Elijah was feeling. But he did something very smart. He took it to God. 
he went to the Lord and says, oh, here's where it's at. And God explains to him right after that, said, look, it, go back to where you're at. I want you to do this, 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 and this. In other words, you've got work to do. Go back and do it. And then in verse 18, he says, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. You're not alone, Elijah. I've got other people too. You serve me. You know, it's interesting. When Jesus was walking along and he was explaining to Peter, this was after the resurrection, and he said, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And he explained to him that you're going to die for me. And Peter says, what about him? Isn't that like us? Because he's talking about John. John's writing about this. And, and Peter, Jesus says to Peter, you don't worry. If I want him to remain until I come, don't worry about it. You follow me. See, that's the key. And John went on to say, so the rumor came that he was never going to die. And he said, no, he didn't say that. He said, you follow me. That's what it was all about. You see, when we start feeling that we're disconnected, like we're all alone and it's all up to us and we can't do it, when we start feeling like it's no use, that tells us that we have lost connection with the one who brings hope. And it's time to stop for a moment, to pull away to get to that place where you can hear his voice and share your heart. Second Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, or the new creature, creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. See, Jesus makes all things new. Everything's different. When we first came to Christ, can you remember back when you first asked Jesus to forgive your sins and you had that sense of freedom, that sense of forgiveness, and all of a sudden life looked different because you understood that you belonged to Him? We need to get back there. We need to be in touch with Him. We need to sense that newness. John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 1, the first verses there. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands had touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. Jesus is our life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. In that verse, that word can be ours or yours. It depends on which way you want to take it. So it's all of us. It's all y'all and me that our joy might be complete. Why? He's saying, I proclaim this to you. We've, we've seen life. Jesus is the life. In him was life. And the darkness can't overcome it. The darkness can't comprehend it. We need to be connected with him. And when we're connected with him, instead of cynicism, there's joy. So when you start feeling, what's the use I've prayed for that person for 20 years and they're still where they were at. Stay in touch with Jesus because Jesus can do what no person can do. So without the fresh breath of the Spirit daily filling our lungs, we dry, we dry up. And our life just dwindles. Without the constant inflow of the living water, we're dry. If we don't stay connected to the vine, we can't bear fruit. 
Because the life is in Jesus. He's the vine. We're the branches. And we need to draw our life from Him. And that means you got to spend time with Him. And share your heart with Him. Jesus said in John chapter 7, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said with a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, rivers of living water will flow from within them, from their inmost being, from their belly. Then John goes on to say, By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that point, or up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So Jesus is standing there and saying, If you're thirsty, come to me and drink. If you're feeling like you're all dried up and you can't go on, come to me and drink. It's the same thing as as taking that yoke we talked about last week. But it's not only will your thirst be quenched, he said, whoever comes to me and drinks, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. See, you are to be a source of blessing, and you can't be a source of blessing unless you receive, and you can't receive if you don't spend time with the Lord in prayer. And when we're due, when we do, we're told that out of our inmost being, God's life flows. God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing. Hebrews 6, 19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for our souls, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus is. So that this hope that we have in Christ is, is the anchor that keeps us from drifting in this sea of despair that's all around us. And sometimes the days get pretty dark. But Jesus is still the light. And he says, And you're the light. As we take his life in our lives, then that hope helps us to avoid the cynicism. Prayer keeps us anchored to hope so that we don't drift toward cynicism. Now, some of us, <laughs> this is a bigger problem than others, right? I mean, you know, there, there are people that are half glass full and people say, what glass? But all of us have this problem. If we're not anchored to Jesus, we're going to drift. So how are you doing this morning? Do you sense that cynicism chipping away at your hope? Reconnect to Jesus. Secondly, Ed Rawl said, if we're not spending time in prayer, if we're not prayerful, if we're prayerless, then we become calloused. There's one phrase that I remember that he said it really stuck to me. He says, sometimes the friction of congregational conflict, you get that? <laughs> Rubs blisters on the surfaces of our souls. <laughs> and they don't mean feet <laughs> or hearts. You know, and it's not just, and of course, congregational conflict, anybody who's been involved, that infects everybody. And uh, when you have difficulties in life and people are mean, have you noticed that? Sometimes people can be mean. They're not just unpleasant, they're just plain mean and hurtful. And somebody's hurt you. So what do you want to do? Protect yourself, right? So what are calluses? Well, if you're digging a a trench, you're digging a hole, especially if you didn't put your gloves on, what happens? The skin of your hands disappears, and you get those blisters, and it's sore. But if you you constantly, if you're a ditch digger, (laughs) and we look at your hands, your hands aren't going to be like the person that's typing all the time. 
there's going to be calluses, right? Because the calluses build up on your hands. Why did they do that? To protect the skin underneath so that you are not as sensitive to the traumas of life. Jesus talked about people not hearing his words and why he talked in parables. He said, for this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and have closed their eyes. So when our hearts become calloused, different than our hands, but it's the same principle, right? There's friction, there's pain, there's blister, so we protect it. So our hearts become calloused. So it doesn't hurt, but it doesn't feel. And we're not sensitive. The psalmist says, Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I have kept your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling, but I delight in your law. So there are other people that are callous, and they're the ones that will hurt you. And the idea then is I'm going to hurt them back, or at least I'm going to pull back. Sometimes I'll pull back into my cocoon. I'll protect myself, whatever. I'm not going to put myself out there. And so there's that callousness. But the psalmist says, but I am going to stay in your law. I'm going to stay close so that I don't become callous toward God. In our relationships with our conflicts, there's hurt so that we develop those callous so we don't feel the pain, but that also makes us insensitive. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a couple story, a story. He says, he came to some people and he said, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was homeless and you didn't give me a place to stay. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was hungry. Uh, you know, all of these things. And they said, when? And there's two groups. Those who did help and those who didn't. But both of them said, when? When did we see you, Lord? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So the one group who responded, their hearts weren't callous. They felt the hurt. They felt the pain of others. They had empathy. Why? Because they were in touch with Jesus. Because the others, he said, depart from me. I never knew you. You see, if you say you love God and you don't love your brothers and sisters, if you don't love the people around you, you know what John says? You're self-deceived. You lie and do not do the truth. You can't... Love God and not love people because God loves people. And when we're in touch with Him, He fills our heart with His love, with His Spirit, and we have this hope that there can be change so that we move out to connect with people, even though at times that means pain. Here's an example of the Pharisees having callous hearts. Mark chapter 6. Jesus was in the synagogue, and there was a, a person there who had a withered hand. And they were all watching him real close. What's he going to do? Is he going to heal this person? And it's a Sabbath. We're not supposed to do work, and healing is work. So is he going to heal this person? So Jesus asked them, what is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. So he asked the group, what's lawful? They knew what he was talking about. They remained silent. Nobody said a word. He looked around. This is verse 5 of Matthew, or Mark chapter 6. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts or their hard hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand and was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. See how hard their hearts were? They didn't care about this person. And they were definitely not being responsive to Jesus. He was their enemy. 
And Jesus looked, and what was his, what was his reaction to the hard-heartedness of the Pharisees? Anger and distress. There might be times that the Lord might look at us and say, why don't you care? Why won't you put yourself out there? Why won't you do what I've called you to do? Why have you let your hearts become hard? John chapter 4 we have an account of hardness of the heart of the disciples. Now, these are people that have left everything to follow Jesus. I think we identify more with them, at least I hope. And they were going through Samaria, and they stopped at the well, and Jesus sent them into the city to get food. And this is the part where the woman comes out to the well, and, and, and she's coming out to draw water at midday, and Jesus said, can you give me a drink? And she said, why do you talk to me? I'm not Jewish, and I'm a woman. And he said, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me, and I'd give you something to drink, and you'd never be thirsty again. Back to that passage we were just talking about, rivers of living water. So he's talking to her, and the disciples come back. They say, here, eat something. And they're surprised he's talking with this woman, but they don't say anything. <laughs> and, uh he said, eat something. He said, I have food that you don't know anything about. What? Somebody bring him something? Where did he get some food? He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. And then it goes on. This woman went back into town, and she told all the people that she'd met Jesus, come and meet a man that told me everything I'd ever done. It, this, this, maybe this is the Messiah. And so there's these people streaming in to the well. They're coming from the city. Now, where have the disciples been? In the city. They went in and got the food. They got the food. Think they talked to anybody about Jesus? Doesn't sound like it. But this woman went back into the city, and she told everybody. And probably she was not, well, she wasn't a leader in the city, okay? People maybe didn't respect her a whole lot, but they wanted to see who she was talking about. And as these people are coming out, Jesus has these words, and he says in verse 35 of John chapter 4, Do not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I tell you, raise your eyes. See these people coming? And observe the fields. They are white for the harvest. You see, sometimes we think, oh, people aren't going to... This world is so lost. People aren't responding to Jesus. Well, maybe the issue isn't the world. Maybe our hearts have become calloused toward the needs and the hurts of those around us and toward the leading of God's Spirit so that we go into the city and we pass all of these people and don't even think about their needs. All we want to do is get our food. So what's the key? Ezekiel chapter 36. I encourage you to read that whole passage. We'll just look at two verses, 26 and 27. God's promise is, I will give you a new heart and put my spirit in you. I will remove from your, I will move from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my defense and be careful to keep my laws. Wow, what a neat promise, huh? God says, I'm going to do heart surgery. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to take that hard heart out so that you can be sensitive. Oh, that God would take and cut the callousness off our hearts so that our hearts could beat, so that we'd know life so that we could sense the leading of His Spirit, not be so self-absorbed, and so that we would move through life in a prayerful attitude that says, Lord, who do you want me to touch today? Not just at 224 every afternoon, but as we move through our days each day. Lord, who do you want me to touch? Who's hurting that needs encouragement? Who's... Who's down that needs to be lifted up? Who's, 
who can I help? Not just who can I preach to, but who can I share your love with? So how you doing? Kind of hard-hearted, maybe? Oh, maybe not a stone heart, but a few scars that maybe need to be healed. And when we don't stay connected to Him, that hardness spreads. Prayer keeps us tender to His Spirit so that we don't become callous. The third C that Everall talked about is compromise. Oh. John says, do not, 1 John 2, 15 through 17, do not love the world or anything in the world. Now, I have to stop here a second. So, well, hold it. Didn't say God so loved the world? <laughs> so what we're talking about a couple of things. One is the world... <laughs> That's everybody in it and, and the world. And God loves us and he loves the world in that sense. But then do not love the world or anything in the world. It's talking about setting our hearts and our minds on things above, not on earthly things. It's this world system. It's explained as we go on. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, now this is what it's talking about, the lust of the flesh, we know what that is, right? That's the appetites and desires of our bodies. The lust of the eyes. <laughs> I think the, king, the Ten Commandments called that covetousness. <laughs> I want that, I want that, I want this, I want that. It's what the writer of Ecclesiastes says, the eyes never have enough of seeing. And the pride of life. I'm my own man. I'm going to do what I want to do the way I want to do it when I want to do it. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. All these things come not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. See, unless we're connected to Jesus, the rough edges of this world will begin to smooth down the rough edges of the gospel. Because Jesus made it very clear, you follow me. When we stay close to him, the rough edges of the gospel start to wear off the rough edges of the world. So we are transformed. There's all kinds of ways we'll compromise. God says something and it's like, oh, that's not very popular right now. I don't think I ought to preach that sermon. Those people there might not take it too well. I remember years ago, it, there's practice at the Barberton School board meetings is a local pastor will pray before the board meeting. Eh, it's not a big deal. You know, it's a little, in my first time, I think, young pastor, new in town, praying before the board meeting, came to the end, and normally when I end my prayers, I use that phrase, in Jesus' name. Because Jesus said, pray in my name. Now, it's not just that phrase, right? It's, it's praying in his name. It means with his authority. When we pray, we're able to pray because of what Jesus has done. There's a whole lot involved with that. But I came down to the end, and I didn't say, in Jesus' name. And I knew I didn't. It wasn't just I forgot. It, and I don't always say in Jesus' name, and that's not an issue, I don't think. When I pray, if it's going to be a real prayer, it's going to be in Jesus' name, whether you say it or not, right? But I didn't say in Jesus' name because Jesus might offend somebody in this public meeting. And I'll tell you, God's Spirit pierced my heart afterwards. I've not forgotten it. 
Nobody else even knew what was going on. Nobody else probably even gave it a thought. Sometimes we don't do it quite like that. We say, in your name. Because we don't want to say the name Jesus. Now, it's no problem to say in your name. Because we know that means Jesus. But if we're saying that because we don't want to use the name Jesus because it might offend somebody, that's caring more about what people think than what God thinks, right? I had to repent. So thankful that the Lord is merciful and He's forgiving. And He continues to use us. But there's all kinds of ways we compromise. Sometimes we give in to those temptations that, that are beating at our hearts. Sometimes we won't respond the way God says. I mean, the Lord said to Ezekiel, warn these people, if they don't listen, then the blood is on them. But if you don't warn them, then their blood's on you. We have a responsibility to speak for God. When I think about no compromise, it doesn't necessarily mean be belligerent, okay? <laughs> I mean, there's some people, oh, I'm not going to compromise on anything. Well, maybe not, but the, I don't see the love of Jesus there. Those hearts are pretty hard, I think, maybe. <laughs> But it's the idea that I am going to do what God calls me to do regardless if it's costly. Right? Think of Daniel and his three friends taken from Israel and in exile in Babylon. And they've been chosen to an elite group they are now in the king's service, and they are to eat from the king's table. And it says that these three individuals had resolved not to defile themselves with the king's food because it wasn't kosher. Now, they'd already made that decision. They were not going to compromise, but they were not rebellious. Daniel went to the person and said, oh, can we just have veggies and water. The person says, oh, I, I can't do that. The king is, he said, this is what you're supposed to have. And, and how can I give you veggie and water? If you don't look as good as the other, then my job's in trouble. And so they said, tell you what, 10 days, give us vegetables and water and see if we don't do better than the people you feed from the king's table. God, we're trusting you to guide him. And of course, you know the story. They did, and that's what they did. But they'd already resolved they weren't going to eat the other food anyway. Same thing later in the book of Daniel. You've got the three children of Israel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And everybody is to bow down before the golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar has put up when they hear the music. And everybody in the field bows down except these three. And they're officials. They're in the government, okay? Okay. And they don't bow down. They don't follow the law. They don't do what they were told because they're going to worship only God. And somebody says, look, look, look at them. They didn't do it. You know, there's always somebody. <laughs> so they pull them up and they bring them up front where the furnace is and they're there. And, and Nebuchadnezzar, these guys, they do a good job. They're good government employees. He really doesn't want to lose their service. So he says, tell you what, we're going to have the band play again and you'll get a second chance to do what you were told to do. And they said, listen, even if you throw it, because he said, if you don't, we're going to throw you in the furnace. <laughs> even if you throw us in the furnace. So he says, listen, he said, who's God, who's going to save you from that? He says, listen, our God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. Of course, that made Nebuchadnezzar mad. <laughs> so he said, stoke the furnace, make it hotter. And they were thrown into the furnace. And the men that threw him in, it was so hot, it killed the people that threw him in. Threw him in. And it, 
And Nebuchadnezzar looks, and he sees four people walking around in the flames. And he says, didn't we throw in three? Yes, king. Why do I see four? And one looks like the Son of Man. I believe it was Jesus walking in there with him. Though it doesn't explicitly say that in the passage. And he said, Shadrach, Meshach, come on out. They came out, and their ropes had been burned off, but their clothes were not even singed, and they didn't smell like fire. God's able to do what you can't believe he can do. That goes back to number one, remember, about cynicism. Remember, this is God we're talking about. He can do what is impossible. But also, because they were connected to him, there was no compromise. That needs to be our heart. See, even in their uncompromising, they were still good government employees. See, sometimes we suffer at work, not because we're Christians, but because we do bad work. If you're talking to your co-workers about Jesus all the time and not doing your work while you're doing it, well, you get the idea. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. God's able to do what nobody else can do. We can stay supple in His hands and not callous. So we hold on to that hope. Because He who promised is faithful. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23 and 24, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. You know, some people, well, this is my cross to bear. Well, I think you can put that on. But when, when somebody was carrying a cross in Jesus' day, you know what that meant? They were going to be nailed to it. Take up your cross every day. In other words, be prepared to die every day. That's what Jesus is saying. Deny yourself. Follow me. Give up your life. How do we give up our lives? Well, I'm sitting on the couch. I saw something on Facebook. I saw it kind of cute. I said, I tried to get my life's, wife's attention and couldn't, so... I just sat down at the couch and looked comfortable. That did it. I can't laugh. Oh, well, since you're not doing anything. But maybe getting up off the couch and going in and doing the dishes. That might be, oh, I, just, I maybe hit a nerve there. It, it's giving up your life. It's, it's serving what we were talking about last week. It's, it's becoming servants. It's, it, if you want to be great in the kingdom, then give yourself to others. And in doing so, you reap life. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Isn't that true? First of all, <laughs> If you're in a place of being able to give, you're better off than the person that needs to receive, okay? <laughs> but in giving, there is such a sense of accomplishment and joy. And, and when we're, we're touched with Jesus and we give ourselves completely as we give our lives away, that's when we find life. That's why Paul said, tell those who are rich in this present world not to put their trust in riches which are so uncertain, but to be generous and willing to share so they might take hold of life that is truly life. Galatians 5, verses 16 and 25, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. How do we do that? Prayer. Prayerfulness listening to God, responding to Him, living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Prayer keeps us connected to the Savior so that we can resist the compromise that we're constantly being pulled toward. 
These are just three dangers that we fall into when we fail to connect with the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Obviously, there are all kinds of sins, you know, that maybe you were hoping I was going to list in my life. Not doing that today. But we need to be aware that we don't connect with the Lord like we need to. I have yet, I, I mean, I have met a lot of really wonderful, seasoned Christians that uh, are amazing. And I've yet to met any of them that says, oh, yeah, I think I pray as much as I need to. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to pray how often? Without ceasing. Live in an attitude of prayer. But then there are times when we spend time in prayer. We need to connect with the Lord with our lives. This will guard us from cynicism, callousness, and compromise so that we can live in hope, tenderness, and commitment. Would you stand with me, please? Hmm. Lord, you know our hearts. You know each of us. You know where we struggle. Lord, you know one here today that's struggling in a great big way. Pray that you'd move in your spirit, that you'd move upon them, that you'd touch them. Lord, that you'd give them new hope, that you'd cut away the hardness and the pain and the hurt, and that you'd help them to stay committed to you. Lord, for each of us, we pray that you'd help us to constantly be aware of your leading, to be responsive to your spirit. Lord, we're thankful that you are merciful and forgiving. Cleanse us, we pray. Fill us with your spirit and help us to follow you. We pray in Jesus' name.